uh, me to remember. I'll, I'll do my. Okay. okay. So I got to do.
welcome each and every one of you to uh, the beginning of our personal evangelism seminar. So very glad to see everyone. I know we have also some visitors tonight. We want you to know how glad we are that you are here with us. And we hope and we pray that as we look at these matters together, that we'll be encouraged and built up in the most holy faith. We realize the importance of evangelism. We understand, and we're going to be introduced to this tonight uh, by our good brother, Rob Whitaker, who has come to us from house to house and heart to heart. Presently, they are living in uh, Jacksonville, Alabama. But uh, it looks like, as I talked to him a little bit, uh, they are all over the country, so very seldom do they get to see their little dogs or things like that. They're always running here and there and doing the Lord's work. We welcome Brother Whitaker and uh, Sister Whitaker, their two children, Hannah and also Jared. They are with them as well. I want you to notice also in the period of time that we have breaks in that, and at the end, uh, there are a number of tables of books and material out there that you can purchase, and it will help you in your evangelistic work. We're very grateful for our Lord told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You and I have an awesome responsibility and I am very glad tonight to introduce to us in the opening remarks, Brother Rod Whitaker. And uh, I've known Brother Rod for a long time. I didn't realize it until he told me. He knew me when he was just a little fella, up to about my knees or my waist high, uh, when we worked with a church in San Antonio. Uh, Rob was born in Illinois, but grew up in San Antonio. And uh, if you know where Bull Verde is, then you know about the area where uh, Brother Rob grew up. And we appreciate him so very much. It was good to get to talk to him again about some days that I then was able to remember. Uh, the first session that we're going to have tonight is let's get motivated. Then there will be a short break, and we will have a second message. Uh, let us stay with the message. And we appreciate Brother Rob his good family so very much. Tonight, we're going to be having an opening prayer by Brother Ken Strimmel. He is from a congregation in Kempner, Texas. He and his wife, his family, very faithful in the Lord. And I'm so glad to see them to be with us here. Our closing prayer tonight be Brother Lee Fisher, who serves as one of the elders in this congregation. Now, if you will prepare yourself, we'll have Brother Ken come. And after Brother Ken's prayer, then Brother Rob will begin his lesson. Shall we bow together, please? Most gracious, loving, wonderful Heavenly Father. Father, we thank you that we are blessed to be able to be together this evening. Especially, Father, we are so very thankful that we have this study series to help encourage us in our work to serve you. Father, too many of our brothers and sisters have lost the, the motivation and failed to honor you and serve you as they should. Be with us, Father, and bless us and help us to not lose that motivation in our lives. Let us always, Father, love you and serve you. We thank you, Father, that you've been with Brother Whitaker and his family and blessed them with a safe journey to be with us. 
Help us have our hearts and our minds open to the message that he shares with us. And Father, we pray that we can truly work in your service every day of our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I will need a clicker for the PowerPoint. And uh, well, I'm entered, he's coming with it. All right. Good evening, everybody. It is a pleasure to be um, here in Colleen, Texas. Texas is, is my home. And um, it is always good to get back where barbecue means beef. UT uh, stands for Texas. And orange is burnt orange. And um, well, if you're an Aggie fan, I'll take maroon. I, anything is better than what I've got in Alabama. I promise you that. Now, you don't tell the brethren I said that. But what a pleasure it is to be with you tonight. And my family, uh, we travel together. And uh, we go from California to Maine and in between, and we bring the house to house, heart to heart school of evangelism uh, to churches. And uh, we, are, we are not a brick and mortar school. We know that you cannot take off time from work and come to um, Jacksonville, Alabama to be trained as soul winners. And so after about 23 years of full-time preaching, I stepped out of the pulpit and we started a school where we travel and all we do all year long is we travel to churches and we train the saved to teach the lost. And uh, now if you would have asked me five years ago, if I'd be doing this, I thought, I thought you were uh, off your rocker. I said, there's no way I'm gonna leave my work and uh, in Willette and uh, Red Bull in Springs, Tennessee and travel around the country. But you know, sometimes the Lord has different plans for us. And I, we are thankful that we have the opportunity to be here uh, tonight. So this is, a, this is a website and I know it's a little hard to see, but if you have your workbooks tonight, let's just go ahead and get started. Open up your workbooks to the very back page. Now, this is, this is an important part of the seminar. This is uh, the workbook, the personal evangelism workbook. Now, on the very back page, you're gonna find a, uh, a place for notes. In fact, it's on page 110. From time to time, I'm gonna ask you to write something down. I'm gonna to refer to pages in this particular guide. Now, I believe each family is being furnished this guide by the uh, congregation. And so we are grateful for the elders in, in so doing. And everybody also should have, a, uh, every individual should have a copy of the Back to the Bible um, handouts. These are the uh, Back to the Bible uh, evangelism uh, study guides. And we're going to cover those in uh, this series. So here's what I want you to do. Write down evangelism.house2house.com. Now don't put a www in front of it. It's not World Wide Web. It's, 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 a, it's a hidden website because we, only, we, we want members of the church to see it. It's a training website. So it's not necessarily meant for non-Christians, but if they find it, it's okay. This is a website designed for Christians, members of the church. So it's just evangelism.house2house.com evangelism.house2house.com this is a valuable resource lots of tools for you videos to watch and uh, you will find information to help you as we progress now uh, each during each session i'm going to do a little um what we might call housekeeping and i'll tell you a little bit about the materials on the table now those are for purchase there is a small table on the right hand side as you exit all that's free you can take those uh, particular uh, um, uh, publications and they are free for you to read. One of them is called Reaching the Lost. And I wanna refer to it just very quickly. Now, Reaching the Lost is, is basically the way that we report on the progress, uh, the results of the School of Evangelism. So I don't know if you realize it tonight or not, but you are now enrolled in school. Now, I know it's been a long time for some, but you're a student. And as a, a student in a school, we get progress reports. We get progress reports on the churches that are enrolled. For example, every Wednesday morning, about seven o'clock, in your email, you will receive a report. The report tomorrow morning that's coming out is from the St. Mary's Georgia Church of Christ, right there in, on the coast. And there's a report coming out also um, uh, from another congregation at Slipsmont Covington, uh, near Memphis, just north of Memphis. And it's gonna talk about What's happened since we've done this seminar? So if this doesn't work, unfortunately, you're gonna see it. But if it's working, you're also going to see it. 
And I believe you'll be very uh, motivated by the results of the churches that are actually doing the work of this ministry. Brothers and sisters, evangelism works. That's my first job. Tonight in the first lesson, my job is to convince you of that. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. So what is this clipboard for? This is for you to put your name, address, and email address. If you do that, you'll get that sent to you every Wednesday morning, along with other tools you can use to evangelize. So I want you to just uh, very quickly um, imagine in your mind a tackle box. And no, I, you know, ladies have tackle boxes. I've actually seen ladies have tackle boxes with uh, beads in them. I've seen ladies have tackle boxes with thread in them. You know, ladies don't put the same thing men put in their tackle boxes. We have jigs and hooks and, and, and various other sundry things, but ladies have tackle boxes too. You know, Christians need tackle boxes. And we ought to have a tackle box full of tools that we can use in soul winning. I'm going to talk about those tools all week. The first two tools you hold in your hand, it's called the Personal Evangelism Workbook and Back to the Bible. But we're going to add to it. I'm going to talk about them throughout. So you're going to get a description of all those. But here's another tool. Put your name, address, and email address. And we'll begin sending you some of those tools. Now, I don't know what the best way to do this. Can I start this with you? There's a uh, here right here. And um, maybe, brother, could you help me? And just you can just pass that around. And um, I hope that will be uh, something. Now, if you don't want to receive something, you don't have to put your name down. It's not uh, mandatory, but I think you'll, you'll enjoy getting it. Let's go ahead and move forward if I could. Did I go the wrong direction? I think I did. Let's see here. Uh, let's see if I can get this to work. There, uh, I got the, the School of Evangelism, it started two years ago. Now, I've been teaching this for, for 10 years, but it officially started two years full time. My family and I have always loved evangelism. In fact, when I was a young man in San Antonio, Evangelism was a passion of mine, and I'm going to talk about that uh, by way of introduction. And so this has always been something we've focused on, but for the last two years, we've done nothing but focus on it. We've done nothing but uh, uh, um, uh, go out to churches and, and train them, training the saved to teach the lost. Now, I want to see here. Am I going the wrong direction with this? I believe I'm hitting the wrong buttons here. There are lots of buttons here, and I don't know. I'm going to get the right one. Someone might have to come tutor me just for a minute and show me which button to hit to advance the slide. But while I'm doing that, I get five lessons. Five lessons on the principles of evangelism. Now, those principles are very important. They're taught by Jesus. If you don't know the principles, the plan won't make sense. Now, the plan, which I'm going to give on uh, Thursday evening, my wife will give the plan to the ladies. I will give the plan to the men. That plan is going to help it's going to be very uh, actionable. This is not a gospel meeting. You didn't come to hear a lecture from me. This is actually something that you're going to hear. You're going to get something from me that you can do. This is not going to be something that you say, well, man, that was exciting. Um, I enjoyed it, or maybe you didn't enjoy it. I hope you will. But I want you to, when I leave here, I'm going to give you a list of things you can do to experience church growth. The average church, when they go through this particular um, teaching, training sessions, experiences a 300% increase in their baptisms. Let me put that into real numbers. You have zero, you get three. You have three, you have nine. You have nine, you have 27. And so we have churches right now. I'll give you a couple. Morganton, Georgia is a congregation. Last year, we went small church, 60 members, rural area, 19 baptisms. They, they have considered you were 60, now you're 80. <laughs> And you did that. How did you do that? Because you practice evangelism. Fayetteville, Georgia, just south of Atlanta, in, in six months, they had 14. St. Uh, Maryland, there's a brother Sykes out there, uh, Eric Sykes. And man, this is really exciting because they, they just took the videos. I do this by video. We did a video training series, enrolled them in the school. They've had 16 baptisms since then. So, so I know that what you're about to experience is going to be, it's going to be we're afraid of the word change, Brother Carter, in the church because we don't want to change doctrinally, and I don't want you to either. Brethren, I'm going to be honest with you. If we don't have a cultural change in the church, we won't be here. There is a cultural change that has to take place in churches of Christ, or we're not going to make it. And so I'm at the very front of this. I'm going to be honest. I am seeking a cultural change. So Proverbs 11.30 says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. 
I don't believe there's a wiser thing for a church to do than to focus on evangelism. Of all the things, of all the programs you've got going on, I don't know that there'll be any of them that would top this. And in fact, until we put this on the top of the list, we're not going to grow. If this is just a bullet point, if this is a line item in your budget, if this, if evangelism is just one of one of many things that you're doing, it's not going to work. Brothers and sisters, evangelism must be the thing that you do. It's got to be the. It, it's got to be the. It, it's got to be the one thing. There it is. So let me lay it out real quick tonight. My first lesson. Let's get motivated. My my job is to convince you it works. That's a big job because most brethren don't believe it works. Most of us don't believe it works here. Now, it may work in India, but not here. And so I've got to, I've got to climb that mountain with you tonight. Then we're going, to, we're going to notice how does it work when you stay with the Bible. There's a lot of us that have been taught and we, we, we've heard that the only way for the church to grow is, 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 is to do things that uh, stretch the limits, gimmicks and gadgets. Uh, we've got to be more you know, up, up, updated. We, we've got to be more with the times in order to grow. And then, of course, I want to talk about how do you get into a Bible study? How do you do it? That's, for most people, their favorite lesson, because it's, it's something you can do. You have a family member, a friend, you want to do a Bible study? I'll show you from Jesus how to get into the study. Then we're going to talk about the method. Uh, uh, if you have no method, you'll have no Bible study. Most Christians have no method. I was down in Sarasota, Florida earlier this year, had a crowd of 200 plus people. I had like a dozen churches represented. I had a question. It was a simple question. I said, how many of us in the are teaching someone the gospel? Do you know how many people raised their hands? Less than 10. Less than 10. We're going to move forward and talk about applying the model. We're going to make, the, we're going to make this real in your world. People are not cookie cutters. We're not, we're not here to play dot to dot. You know, everybody's different. You're going to experience uh, um, questions. How do you do it? A lot of people are afraid of evangelism because um, maybe it's not going to work for your friend. Now, I'm going to show you it can work, and we're going to make it real. We're going to look at the application. That's the plan for men and women. The, the principles don't work if there's no plan. We want to put you to work. And so this is... Some might call a spiritual boot camp. So let's go ahead and get started. In the year 2000, there were 13,155 churches of Christ. In the year 2009, there were 12,629 churches of Christ. In the year 12,300 churches of Christ. In the year 2018, 11,965 churches of Christ. And brethren, I can tell you in the year 2020, it's catastrophic. We're declining. I had somebody come up after I first pres presented these numbers. This is years ago. He said, oh, Rob, he says, you know, there's no need to get riled up about that. He says, we're, we're not declining. I said, really? He says, we're just consolidating. Isn't it interesting how somebody puts another word on it to make it feel better? He says, no, we're, we're just the world churches. We don't need a church on every street corner. We're consolidating. I said, Brother, if that's the case, you explain these numbers to me. In the year 2000, we had 1,224,000 church members. In the year 2009, 1,224,000 church members. In 2015, 1,180,000 church members. 2018, 1,128,000 church members. Where do you think we are today? There are more churches of Christ closing the door in 2020 and not opening than I have ever seen in my life. We, we have churches still that have not assembled since March. Friends, they may never assemble again. You know why? Their members are gone. We have church, the average church right now is suffering about 25 to 30% loss in their membership. And there are some we haven't seen them since the beginning of March. Now, I understand there are some health reasons that cause some not to get out, but I, I can't tell you, I can't, I can't hide my fear tonight as a gospel preacher there are going to be some of those we won't see again 2020 has been a catastrophic year for us 
I want to put this into historical perspective for you. So let's, let's start. 1906, 85 million people in this country, members of the Lord's Church, 159,000. Go to 1946, 141,000, um, 141 million people in our country, members of the Lord's Church, 682,000. Let me try to make that ratio make sense. In 1906, you would walk across 535 um, ranches, people, before you find a member of the Lord's church, that's a lot of walking. But in 1946, that would be going to 207 ranches or people before you found a member of the Lord's church. Then in 1953, you had a population of 160 million. Notice the members of the Lord's church, 1.5 million, ratio one to 106. You went to 1973, 211,000 in this country, 2.5 million members of the Lord's church. Now the ratio is one to 84. Let me, let me put this into perspective for you. The Lord's church grew during World War I. The Lord's church grew during the Great Depression. The Lord's church grew during World War II. The Lord's church grew during Korea. The Lord's church grew during the feminist movement. The Lord's church grew during civil rights. The Lord's church grew during Vietnam. And in, in, in the most tumultuous periods of our nation's history, the Lord's church grew. No wonder America became the greatest nation on earth. Because righteousness exalts a nation and sin is a reproach to any people. But brethren, do you know what's happened for the last 40 plus years? We have done nothing but decline. Friends, we're losing. We're losing the church of Christ in America. I didn't say we're losing the church of Christ. It's growing in some countries, but we're losing it in our own country. Brethren, if we want to see America come back to its greatness again, may I suggest you that the answer is not on November 3rd, but the answer sits in our pews. Because what makes America and a country great is God's people. And the more people of God we got in a nation, the better that nation will be. The answer is not in the presidency. The answer is not in the courts. The answer is in the church of Christ. And my call to all churches tonight is, brethren, let's get busy. Because we have the answer. We're losing. We have brethren they have not seen success in their lifetime. They're now coming to an age where they can be deacons. Some are almost to be elders. And yet we have men coming into the eldership right now and they've not seen evangelistic success. They don't know about the growth of the church. Those who've seen it, those who experienced it, those who are part of that growth, that great generation, it's just about gone. That is frightening. Because that means in the pews of churches of Christ all over America, we have members of God's people. They don't know if it works. They don't believe it works. They've never seen it work. It's been nothing but failure after failure. We haven't had net growth in this country in almost 50 years. That's frightening. The question is why? Why were we able to grow so quickly and rapidly? Why were we, why were we, 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 were, we weren't just growing rapidly, brethren. Let me just be honest with you. Our religious neighbors, they were scared to death of the church of Christ. There wasn't a religious group out there that grew faster, more rapidly. The church, Brother Winkler used to say, we're the church everybody's talking about. You know what's sad now? People aren't talking about us because they, they don't even know we're here anymore. Now that's enough of a, that's enough of a negative message. I start with the, the bad news because I want to, I want, I want to, I don't want this to be a, a, a period of a guilt trip. I'm not trying to do a guilt trip on you. This is gut check time. This is, this is a time where God's people just need to be real. We don't need to pretend anymore. Let's not pretend it's okay. Brethren, it's not okay. Look at your building tonight. 
looks like all the other buildings in America, once full of Christians. And now we're just hoping to hold out. I don't know if you recall your Texas history or not, but holding out didn't work well at the Alamo. And I'm going to suggest tonight that trying to hold out isn't going to work well for us at all. I was sitting in my office. I got a phone call. His name was Chris Coyle. He said, hey, Rob. He says, my name's Chris Coyle. I said, great, Chris. I said, my name's Rob. And he said, uh, he said I've, I've, got a, I've got a name for you. I've got a Bible study for you. I said, man, that's, I love Bible studies. He said, give me the name. He said, we've got a new Christian. and Her name's Scarlett Mitchell. And um, she's got a mom and dad back home. Doesn't live very far from you. He says, um, I want you to go do a Bible study with him. I said, oh, I, I just, I love Bible studies. I, I was so excited to write that name down. I said, Chris, I said, when do they expect me? He said, oh, we haven't selected a date yet. I said, it's all right, I'm flexible. I said, Chris, when did they request the Bible study? He said, oh, Rob, they haven't. I said, Chris, so what you want me to do is, is, is go up to the house of Jackie and Sheila Birdwell and just do a Bible study with them? How do you suppose I do that? He says, I have no idea, but that's your problem now. I hung up the phone. I looked at that piece of paper. I thought about it for a few minutes, and I did what any good preacher would do. I crunkled that thing up, put it in the trash can, the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard, and I went back to the important things like writing the church bulletin. After all, you have to have a church bulletin or you get fired. So I finished my church bulletin like any good preacher, and I went back out to my truck, and I'm ready to go home. And all of a sudden, it dawns on me. Rob, you can't, you can't throw a soul away. You're better than that. Get back in. So I walked back into my office. I pulled out that piece of paper, and I laid it on the table. I have no idea what I'm going to do with you, Jackie and Sheila Birdwell. I went home. Thought about it, came back the next day, and you know what was in my office? That piece of paper. It stared at me all day, and I said, well, you know, at least I can pray about this. So I did. I prayed. I prayed for Jackie and Sheila. I prayed. I prayed that God would give me wisdom, and a door of utterance, and just I kept praying about this. And I said, well, you know, I can study about it. And I, I, I did something I'd never done before. I studied Jesus as my Savior when I, was, when I was a teenager. I studied him as the head of the church as I got older. I studied him as the creator of the world. I, I studied Jesus in a lot of ways. I'd never studied Jesus as an evangelist. That changed. I opened my Bible and I, I asked, what made Jesus so successful? And I started finding that the things that made Jesus successful, I didn't do them. And the things that I did, he didn't do it. And I knew that I had at that point to make some changes. And so I started to strategize. I said, if I meet this couple, if I get an opportunity, this, so I had a plan, I put it together. I, I, I know what I want to say when I see them. And then there's um, Jonathan uh, Smith comes back from the University of Tennessee. They call that UT. Isn't that something? And he, he comes back from UT, and he, he sits in my office, and he says, Rob, I'm home, graduated, going to get a job here at the local uh, school teaching. I said, man, it's great, Jonathan. I said, you're going to be an asset to the church. He said, met a young lady, Christian. Her name's Elizabeth, going to get married. I said, man, that's, that's great. We talked for a little while, and he finally said, Rob, he said, I'll tell you what. He said, I've got to, he said, I've got to go see my best friend, Evan Birdwell. Evan Birdwell? Uh, uh, Jonathan, is he related to Jackie and Sheila Birdwell? Oh, yeah. That's like my second parents, Rob. Really? I said, take me with you. He said, take you with me. I said, take me with you. He said, why do you want to go see Jack? I said, Jonathan, I, I explained it to him, got in the car. We got to the house, knocked on the door. So he knocks. She opens the door. Jonathan. Jonathan, oh, Jackie, it's John, Jonathan's at the door. Man, she grabs and hugs him. Evan's not home. He's working. She looks over her, the show and said, Who, who's that with you right there? Oh, he says, oh, that's my, that's just my friend, Rob. Well, any friend of Jonathan's a friend of mine. Just come on in, you know, and, 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 and we sit down. She gets the tea out, you know, sweet tea out. That's like a good Southern woman. Get that chocolate chip cookie out. And we just sat and visited. 20 minutes. And then we came to the awkward moment. Now, who did you say you were again? I said, my name is uh, Rob Whitaker. And I'm the preacher for the Willette Church of Christ. And Sheila, you have questions for me. I just know. She said, I sure do. 
And she just rolled them off her tongue like she rehearsed them. And, 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 and I had a plan. You know what my plan is? I will not answer. I am not going to play 20 questions. I am not going to sit there and go back and forth with her. I know it's going to be futile, and that's not what Jesus ever did. And so what I did is I practiced something I learned from Scripture. I deferred it. I kept moving it forward. I kept the conversation going. And, and, she, and she, she, you, you could tell that she was a little confused because it wasn't as I was ignoring her, but she wasn't getting the answer she wanted. So she just kept coming at me, and I, kept, I just kept, you know, I was kind of like Muhammad Ali, you know. They hit hard, but he just kept moving back. And, you know, so I, I just kept moving back. And, and she couldn't, and finally she just, finally she just stopped. And she said, Jackie, she says, why won't that preacher answer my questions? I said, Sheila, that's a good observation you just made. I tell, I tell you what. I said, do you have a little time I, 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 would, I could show you the answers? Show me? I said, yes, yeah, in the Bible. You mean like a Bible study? I said, well, Sheila, you call it whatever you want to. She, Jackie, she says, can we do a Bible study with the preacher for the Church of Christ? I'll never forget what he said. He said, now, honey, I don't think it's ever wrong to study the Bible. And um, she says, oh, I'll tell you what, preacher. She said, we'll do this study with you, but it must be a secret study. No one can know. I said, well, I've never done one of those before. I said, I, I, I'll make a counter proposal to you. I said, I'll tell you what we need to do. I said, will you let me just tell my elders? Because I think if my elders are praying about it, the study will go better. And prayers are, well, she said, who are these men? I said, well, Hugh Clark, Hugh Wayne Clark, Joe Lynn. Well, I know those men. She says, those are good men. And you tell them not to tell anybody. I said, that's a deal. We set an appointment, came back Monday evening. I, I went home, by the way, told my wife and family all about it. The church is praying, they're praying. I, I, I talk about evangelism from the pulpit all the time. I got up to the pulpit. I said, brethren, we've got a Bible study starting Monday. I need you praying about this. I can't tell you the name, but God knows. Would you pray? And we pray about it. I went to their house Monday night. I had my Bible, had my back to the Bibles ready, you know, uh, just to start. And she, she invited us in. We sat at the kitchen table, and then I passed out the book. She said, now wait just a minute, preacher. She says, I need to tell you about my religious experience. I got my pen out, and I got my paper out, and I started to write. She said, Rob, it was a, a late night. It was dark, scary. Lightning strikes, thunderstorms, rain, couldn't see in front of me. All of a sudden, the lightning struck the tree, wham, and went down in front of me and caught on fire. I turned my car, went down into the ditch, and Jesus came to me that night. And the Holy Spirit saved me. I, I, I was, I, the tingles came over me, and I went to church that Sunday. I told my story, and I testified about it, and they voted on me. You don't believe me, do you? I said, Sheila, if that's what you said happened, I said, keep going. She said, she said, and they voted on me as a, as a candidate for baptism. And I joined the church right there, and a month later, I was baptized. I said, all, Sheila? She said, that's what happened. I said, okay. I said, Sheila, can we turn to John 8, 32 now? She says, well, that, you don't have any questions? I said, if that's what you said happened. Oh, yes, we can. I said, let's go to John 8. And we started John 8, 32. It's in the green book, first, first verse. And she read it. And she put the answer down. I said, Jackie, would you get the second one for me? And we began to go around the study, and they began to fill it in. They knew their books of the Bible. This is, a, this is a religious family. Strong convictions. At the end of the study, I said, Jackie and Sheila, what do you think about that? He said, man, I really liked it, Rob. He said, in fact, there's some things about us you need to know. I said, okay. He said, I'm the deacon of the Missionary Baptist Church. I said, all right. He says, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm the Bible class teacher. I said, great. He said, he said and, 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 and my wife, she started the children's Bible classes there. I said, just fine. He says, I'm also the treasurer. I said, Jackie, you're a very religious man, aren't you? You're committed. He says, I am. I says, I like committed people. He says, Rob, I noticed something tonight. As you were doing this study, you didn't skip any verses. He said, whatever the verse said, you just wrote it down. I said, that's all we're going to do, Jackie. He said, you know, sometimes when I'm teaching the adult class, I, <laughs> either I don't understand the verse or we don't do that. I said, well, I, 
I said, why don't we come back for a second study? We have three to do. Let's, let's just do, would you like a second? He said, I sure would. I said, let's come back for the second. So we came back, I told my wife all about it, the church, uh, you know, we're praying about it. We come back for the second study and sit down. This is a, this, this study's on the church of Christ. There's a lot of differences between what they believe and what the Bible says. I lay them out. I lay them out one by one. You know what Jackie's attitude, in fact, I, st- I said, Jackie, is that, you any questions about that? Because I knew it was vastly different. He said, Rob, as long as it's in the Bible, I believe it. And I respect people like that, don't you? I mean, I respect people. Say, if it's in the Bible, I don't care what anybody else says. I'll do what the Bible says. We finished that study. Man, I'm, I'm on cloud nine. I mean, this, this study is going so well, but I don't want to mess it up. You know, I, I t- you want to mess a study up? We'll, you know, God won't mess it up. Sometimes we mess it up. So, so I, I said, man, I got to know more about, I don't know what a missionary Baptist is. I know what a general Baptist is. I know what a Southern Baptist is. I know what a Northern Baptist is. I don't know what a missionary Baptist is. I said, I said I'll tell you what, I'm going to call Scarlett, the daughter who, who became a Christian. I, I said, Scarlett, um, can I ask you a question? I said, uh, why, why, did you, why, why did you become a, a Christian? She said, she said two things I'll never forget. I mean, she was so... She was so excited on this phone call. She was telling me her mother's calling her every day to talk about it. I mean, Scarlett, you, you get to see the energy. I mean, she's so hopeful. And, and let me share it with you one thing she said. She said, Rob, when I told my parents I was going to become a Christian, they warned me what would happen. They said, now, Scarlett, you know they're excommunicate you. I said, excommunicate? What in the, I don't even know what excommunicate means. I've never seen it in the Bible. She said, well, that, uh, Rob, what they said is that they're going to come and, and, and excommunicate me. And she said, I was ready. I said, ready for what? She says, I'm going to convert them. I'm going to show my parents why I did what I did. I had my Bible ready and I was open. And she said, those men came into the, the living room and they popped open the briefcase and they brought out the tablet paper and they looked at me and they found my name on the roster and they erased it. I said, okay, what else did they do? Well, they put it back in the briefcase and shut it. I said, what else did they do? She said, they left. My mother was livid. She said, Jackie, you mean they're not even going to try to read the Bible? They're not even going to try to have a Bible? So, Jackie, we've been, we mean we've done this all our life and that's all we get. She said, I just thought you might like to know that. I said, that's, I appreciate that, Scarlett. Jonathan Smith and I drove over that night, and we're, we're now in the, the last study, and Jackie's got to have a private meeting with his wife, Sheila. Jackie says, now, Ra- Sheila, that little preacher's coming over here tonight. He thinks he's going to convert to us. He's got another thing coming. Sheila, we've been a Baptist all these years. He says, I'm going to die a Baptist. And Sheila says, shoo. She says, Jackie, I, ha, I was born a Baptist. Mama's a Baptist, grandmama's a Baptist, daddy's a Baptist, aunt so-and-so's the Baptist. And she, he says, she says, I'm going to die a Baptist. He says, good, I'm glad we've got that covered. And then I knock on the door. We opened the door and I walked in and sat down around the, the uh, kitchen table. I got out book number three. I said, let's just read our Bibles. We started reading our Bibles. It was going really well. Until we got to baptism. I knew when we got to that mountain, it was going to be hard for them to climb it. So I was prepared. In fact, what I did is I took a chart out of your work, that workbook you've got, and I'm going to go over it later, but I, I laid that chart out. It's, in, it's actually in back to the Bible. I drew a circle in Christ. I showed Jackie how you get into Christ, and I, I reread those verses together. And do you know what happened? He got it. His eyes began to water. His hands began to shake. And I knew he got it. I said, Jackie, I don't normally do this in a Bible study, but I called for the invitation. I said, Jackie, I said, what are you going to do with this? He said, Rob, he looked at you straight in the eyes. He said, Rob, he says, I know exactly what I've got to do now, and I'm going to do it. I knew what he was saying. Sheila knew what he was saying. She looked it over at her husband, and she, she hit him in the gut. He, he grabbed his stomach, and she said, Jackie, you said we weren't going to do that. And he looked back at his wife, and he said, honey, we have no choice. That's what the Bible says. Chills ran up and down my spine when I heard that. 
I said, Jackie, let's go right now. He said, Rob, I can't. I said, can't. Brother, and I spent the next 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and I did everything in my power to try to convince him to do it that night. I, I read every verse. Almost I persuaded me. Today is a day of salvation. Life is a vapor. I went everywhere. He wouldn't budge. I finally said, Jackie, I said, what, what are you waiting on? He said, Rob, you don't understand. I hold the bag. I said, the bag? He said, I hold the bag. He said, you know what would happen if I went and, and I became a Christian tonight? He said, they would accuse me of all sorts of stuff. i got to resign. You know, that bothered me for years, Brother Carter. I didn't understand that. But there's a great difference between a 15-year-old repenting and a 55-year-old repenting. Jesus said, bring ye therefore fruits worthy of repentance. Sometimes repentance takes a little bit more time he says, Rob, I'm going to do it. You can come to my house every day until I do. And you can bug the fire out of me. Well, you know I'm a good preacher. I did. I went over every day. I, my family went over. I introduced my children and my wife to them. And, and, and he said, go pick strawberries. We had more strawberries than we knew what to do with. We picked tomatoes. And, you know, we swang in that, in that front porch. And I'd look over. I said, Jackie, is today the day? Not yet, Rob. But it's coming. I was standing in the back of the auditorium about this size at Willette. And uh, Jill, uh, Sister Jill, and I were talking, and uh, she looked up. Rob, Rob, look who's in, look who's coming in the building. Rob, that's Jackie and Sheila Birdwood. Rob, is that them? I said, it is. She says, I can't believe it. And that's our problem. Brethren, we don't believe. See, we don't believe this works. It works for our children, maybe uh, most of the time. Maybe a benevolent uh, occasion, it works. But, you know, it, it, it's a, people in America aren't interested anymore. Send them to New Zealand, right? When the invitation song was offered that evening, the Willette Church of Christ wept. Jackie and Sheila were baptized into Christ for the remission of their sins. That night, it changed the church. The church believed. From that night, as we started in that congregation, about 220 people, I mean, we just started baptizing people left and right, 230, 240, 260, 270, 290, 300, and we just kept baptizing because people believed. When Jackie became a Christian six months later, he's behind the pulpit. He's doing a Wednesday night invitation song, an uh, invitation lesson for the Lord's church. The first thing I wanted to do when he became a Christian Teach his son. His name's Evan. Evan would stop by and listen to the Bible study. And I would watch his girlfriend sometimes, Amy, would stop by. Then they'd just go, yeah, they'd go back downstairs. Tell Evan was curious. I said, uh, Jackie, I said, we need to study with Evan. He said, now, Rob, Evan doesn't quite work like that. I said, work, work like that. Of course he does. I said, we just need to do a Bible. He said, no, Rob, Evan, it's not going to work with Evan. I said, now, Jack, Sheila was listening to the conversation. Now, Jackie, you know, it. Rob, get over there right now and teach Evan. <laughs> so, so, of course, I listened to, uh, I listened to uh, uh, Sheila. So I walked over to Evan. I said, Evan, there have been some changes in your family, your sister, your mother. Your sister. I said, could I spend some time and talk to you about that? He says, don't want to talk about it. That didn't go well. And so I, I backed up again. I, I mean, I, I backed up and, and, uh, and uh, gave him some space. And, uh, and uh, so I, I let, let some time uh, transpire. And I'm always strategizing. I, I tell you, why I when I meet someone, I'm a, if, if I know they're not a member of the Lord, I've I got a strategy. And I'm, I'm thinking, how, how can we help them? Because I want them to go to heaven. And, I, and I'm thinking, I'm praying. Evan, you know what he likes? Airplanes. I'm a pilot, and he loves it when I tell airplane stories. 
And, uh, and so I, I love to fly. In fact, I was just flying yesterday, and I, I, I got a plane out of Stevensville. I flew it around for a couple hours. I, man, I, it's so peaceful up there. And uh, Evan, I, said, man, I went up to Evan. I said, Evan, I said, um, I said, how about I take you for a plane ride? He said, you take me? I said, sure. I said, let's, let's go to the airport. And uh, he said, no, Bob. He, says, uh, he said, man, I'd love to do that. I said, I said I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll even let you fly. I said, we, so we took off, and I got it up to about 5,000 feet. Brother, you can baptize anybody at 5,000 feet, let me tell you. Well, I flew around Dale Hall Lake, and we flew around for a little bit, and uh, we came back, and we landed. And, uh, and uh, I, I said, Evan, today is your day. You can pick where we go to eat. We only have a subway. So it's not. So he said, let's go to Subway. I said, right, let's go. So we go to Subway, and we, we, we get our sandwiches. We're sitting. I mean, you know, he's got a free flight, free food. I said, man, this is going to go great. I said, Evan, I said, would you let me talk to you about Jesus? He said, don't want to talk about Jesus. And I was, I, I, at that point, I was just defeated, but he caught me. He said, but Rob, when I'm ready, I'll let you know. I said, I'll take that. I went, I, some, some time passed by. Uh, we, we went to Bible camp, uh, and uh, it was odd because I was out in Bible camp, and my phone rang. What's odd about this, there's no signal out there. And so my phone rang. I said, well, that's strange. I picked, hello? And Rob, this is Amy. I think I'm going to hell. Would you do a Bible study with me? That was the phone call. I said, what? 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 Yes, uh, who is that? I didn't even know who it was. And, and, and uh, I said, Amy, well, what's going on? And finally, no, that's, that's Amy. Amy, Amy, Evan's girl. Amy's the girlfriend of Evan. And I said, now, Amy, what's going on? He said, well, she said, now, Scarlett gave me this book. She asked me to read it. Called Muscle and a Shovel. Ever hear about it? She said, I read it. I think I'm going to hell. She said, would you do it? I said, man, Amy, I can't wait. She said, I just have one condition. I said, you name it. She says, got to do the study with Evan, too. I said, Amy, Evan doesn't want to do a Bible study. She says, I know, but that's your problem now. I said, how does that keep happening to me? And, uh, and uh, I, I, I said, I said, I'm think, I said, I'm think, I said, I got it. I said, Amy, you know how Sheila likes to cook those Sunday suppers? Have her cook a Sunday dinner, you know, right after morning service. Invite us over. Make sure Evan knows because Evan will be there for his mama's cooking. And you make sure she, he also knows that we're going to do a Bible study. He'll stay. Got it. We do all that. We plan it out. And after supper, uh, dinner, she starts passing out. The, I, I passed out the book. Let's get my Bibles ready. Now, Scarlett, she's driven all the way in from Free Hardman, Somerville, just to witness this. She's on one side of the table. I, pa I start passing out, and we're, they're so excited. Evan sees it coming. He gets up and says, uh-uh. He walks off. He leaves the house, gets in his Mustang, and drives down that crackling gravel road. I can hear him going. Amy is devastated. She just weeps and cries, and, and, and I just can't. And then there's Sheila. Sheila is madder than a hornet. I mean, she just, she, I, what is wrong with my son? You know, and then there's Jackie. He's in the easy chair reading the newspaper. He looks over at all of us and he says, I told you this wouldn't work. I said, Amy, uh, I'll tell you what we need to do. We just need to do the Bible study. Can't worry about Evan. She says, I know, Mr. Rob. And I said, let's do it. Nicole and I, we, we, got the, we passed out the, the booklets and we, she opened to John 8, 32. And Scarlett's right there, you know, wa watching. And uh, we started got down to the third verse and all of a sudden I heard that gravel crackling I heard the Mustang engine come in parked in driveway he opens the back door he walks in and he sits down Scarlett his sister is so excited she says now Evan you'll need these booklets he says I don't want the booklets okay. and then uh, Amy she's so she said now honey you'll, you'll need the Bible I don't need that I just want to listen and he did by the end of the study, he's answering the questions. They left after that study, and I think I, I, Nicole and I think we think we know what the problem is. The problem? He doesn't want to do it in front of mama, daddy, or sister. I said, I said, Scarlett, you've done more good. Your dear family and eternity cannot repay what you've done. You need to go home. I said, I'll keep you updated. I said, uh, we're going to do this study at our house next week. Amy and Evan came over. They sat around our kitchen table. Nicole cooked one of those good dinners. Hannah cooked her dessert. 
We started that Bible study. He took the Bible, the booklet. He answered every question. He is intelligent. Very smart. We finished that first, second booklet, and I, man, I, I see where this is going. We started that third booklet, and we started going through it, and I, I, I knew there was a problem coming on the horizon. I wasn't sure how to handle it. I, I kept thinking, oh, what am I going to do? And I kept thinking, how am I going to handle this? There's a problem, you see, and I, man, I don't want to ruin this. I'm not going to tell you about the problem right now. I'm not even going to tell you what happened. But if you'll come back uh, Thursday night, I'll finish the story. You won't want to miss this. His name's Ed Goosby. We moved in, and, uh, and uh, we're, we're unpacking, and church members are there. You know, but we got this dog. Her name is Rue. Rue is a beagle and border collie. I think that's right, beagle and border collie. And, uh, and she, she chases anything that moves. I got real problems. Can't chain this dog up. Have you ever heard of the invisible fins? Ever heard of that? It's, it's a little collar you put on them, and it's, it's an invisible perimeter. When they, when they get to it, you know, kind of shocks them, and they come back. Well, man, I, I said, I'm going to go get that thing. So I went down to Lowe's, purchased it, put it on, read the directions. Now, I'm moving in that day. Takes six weeks to train dog. I don't have six weeks. I have six minutes. I turned the thing to maximum power. She'll learn. I start, we started unpacking, and we're getting it all out. And all of a sudden, the deer darts off the back of the yard, comes right across the, she sees deer. Boom, who's gone? She just, she hits the perimeter. It lays her out. She's a, she's just a, you know, curling and she's a whining and, you know, barking and, and the kids say, daddy, the dog, and they're running to get, the, I don't touch the dog, kids. And uh, all of a sudden it stops. That doesn't do it too long. And she runs across the road and gets under the house of Ed Goolsby. I was told when I moved in, don't bother Ed Goolsby. Now, Rob, you're going to be tempted to meet Ed, don't go meet Ed Goolsby. I gingerly walk across the road and I knock on the door and he up, yes, can I help you? And I said, oh my. He said, I said, yes, sir. Um, uh, uh, my name, I know who you are. I said, oh my. I said, yes, sir. I need to get my, my dog. Is, it, did you shoot your dog? I said, oh no, sir. I said, I just want to retrieve my dog. He said, go get your dog. So Hannah and Jared get into the house, start getting the dog. I, what a wonderful evangelistic opportunity this is. Mr. Ed, I'm the new preacher. I know who you are. When I'm ready for you, I'll let you know. And he slammed the door. I thought the, I thought the whole frame was coming off. I said, that didn't go well. Brethren, I want you to listen to me very carefully. Ever, ever give up on somebody. It was just a a few months later, there was a new convert, uh, and his name's James. And James is a member of the volunteer fire department, and and uh, Ed is a member of the volunteer fire department. And we're going to go, we're going to go hand out house to house, heart to heart. We're going to hand instead of mailing it, we're going to hand it out. James, you knock on Ed's door. I'm not knocking on his door. You go knock on it. So Ed goes over there. He, you know, James is going to knock on it. Now I go somewhere else, and I get this phone call. Rob, I said yes. This is hey James. How's it going? Good Rob. I went to Ed's house. Oh great. How'd it go with Ed? He wants to see you right now. I said, oh, no. So I get back, and he, he's at the church building. I went back over to the church building. There's Ed sitting at the table. I said, what? And he's crying. I said, Ed, are you okay? He says, no, I'm not. My doctor says I have cancer. He said, Rob, can you help me? I said, Ed, would you open your Bible up? John 8, 32. He was baptized. There's Charles Berry and Mary Hunt, and uh, they're, they're holler. Um, and, uh, and, and you don't have hollers in Texas, not like these. These are these are real deep, deep hollers. And on the top of this one holler is a is a is a house, and it's the it's the city manager of Carthage. I didn't know that. And and these ladies. Uh, Actually, one's been restored. One's a new convert. They're walking along. They see the house. We're, we're again passing out house to house. We do this like once or twice a year. This is another time. And they see this house, and the, these dogs are vicious, barking, just, just scary, scary dogs. And, uh, and uh, Melanie looks at Betty. Betty, you know, Rob told us this morning when he trained us, it's still okay to observe the Passover from time to time. I think we should pass over now. And I said, oh, and, and Betty, bless her heart, she looked at Melanie. She says, now, Melanie, she said, this could be the one. And she, so they begin to walk up the hill. Now, Charles is peeping out the window. He sees them coming. Mary, 
the Jehovah Witnesses are coming, Mary. Mary, they're going, I won't get past me this time. The, Mary, get ready. Mary, get out here. The Jehovah Witnesses are, we're going to get in this time. And they knock on the door, you know, like this. And he, he opens it. Mary, it's house to house, heart to heart. They're here, Mary. Mary, come on in. Betty and Melanie can't believe it. Well, they walk in. They sit down. Betty begins to think, now, what is it that Rob told me to do? Oh, yes, yes. Um, uh, Mr. Charles, uh, uh, um, um, could I tell, tell you a little bit about the church? He said, sure can. She says, oh, no. Um, what is it next? Uh, when would you like to know about the church? He said, right now. She says, oh, no. Um, uh, uh, where would you like to do it? She, he says, we could do it here. We go to your church. She says, uh, would you excuse me just for a second? She gets up and goes outside, and she calls me. She says, Rob, I said, what's wrong, Betty? She said, Rob, I've got a hot one here, and I don't know what to do. And I said, a hot one? She says, yes, they're ready now, Rob. And I said, get them. I said, I'll tell you what, if they'll come to the church building, I'll study with them. Three adults, they sit down in the library, and we study. I didn't know if I'd ever see them again, so I did the one method study. After two hours, Betty got, Mary got real mad. She hit the table. She, she pushed it, and her, her chair rolled back, and it hits the wall. I looked at Charles. I said, Charles, where is your wife going? He says, I don't know, but I'm going to find out. He walked over. I looked over at my wife, Nicole. I said, Nicole, this isn't good. They came back. I said, Mary, are you okay? Charles says, Rob, she's not okay. She wants to know why she's been attending that church for 40 years, and they never told her she had to be baptized. He, he, she looked at me, and she said, why have they been lying to me? The Bible says you got to be baptized, and they said I didn't have. I said, Mary, I don't know why but I know how we can fix it, and we did, and we baptized all three of them. This is Ronnie Rhodes, and, and uh, Ronnie Rhodes has been sitting in our pews for 30 years. He's lost. I finally went to the elder. I said, brethren, I said, we need to work on some of these folks sitting in our pews. I said, I, said, I think we need to do some Bible study. Then, now, Rob, you be careful because we might lose them. I said, I don't think you can get more lost than lost. I did a Bible study with him, and all four were baptized. This is Jerry Conley. I, I, want, I got to Jacksonville Church of Christ. Alan Webster is the preacher at Jacksonville. You may know him. He's one of the most prolific writers we've got in the Brotherhood. He started house to house, heart to heart. He started polishing the pulpit. He started the marriage retreat. He started Spark. Incredibly talented. I went up to Alan. I said, Alan, I said, since I'm here, when I'm here, I'm not there often. We live on the road. I said, when I'm here, I want to practice what I preach. I said, give me a list of every person who sits in these pews that's not a Christian. He says, Jerry Conley. I said, take me to his house, please. We go to his house, and uh, I start looking around, and, uh, and uh, man, this is unbelievable. He's bought his house from the 1850s. He's restoring it. And, uh, and uh, original doorknob, he's in his 70s, him and his Ella Sue, his wife. And, and they're restoring this house, and, and he's showing. I, I said, Jerry, I said, this is, he's giving me the history of our life. I said, my family needs to hear this. May I bring them back? He said, you sure can. I said, great. So I, I went back and next week got my family. I, you, you realize I'm not really interested in the history of Alabama. Okay. And so we, we got back and, uh, and, uh, and I grabbed my family and, 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 and uh, we walked in the door and Jerry starts showing them all about the molding and all about the, you know, the, the original doorknob. Jerry? Is that apple pie I smell? She says, he, Ella Sue has made you a homemade apple pie. I said, let's get in there. So we walk into the kitchen, and, and there it is. She's cutting it up, and we're just talking. And Jerry, are you new to the Jacksonville church? Sure am. Never been to one before. May I tell you about it? Well, sure. I just so happen to have these little booklets. I, I don't know how I got them, but anyway, let, let's look at these together. And so we passed them out. I said, you got a Bible, Ellis? We'll need that. And, uh, and, and let's get our Bibles. John 8, 32. When Jerry realized he was lost, he didn't know. Most people don't know. I've never seen a man drive faster to the church building. I didn't know if he were going to make it or not. And he was baptized. Can I tell you one more story before we take our break? Uh, I'm not very good with clocks. I don't even know what it says back there. I want to tell you one more. I grew up in Bulverde, Texas. Bulverde was 
as country as country could get. I had some horses barn. We had, a, we, had an, we had an arena where my dad broke a horse. And um, we moved there. My, I said, man, I, I want a friend. Mama says, go across the street. I was more than across the street. I had to walk a half mile. But I finally found a house, and I knocked on the door. And that house was four, four boys. One was my age. His name was Mel Hutzler. And uh, I said, want to play? He said, sure. We went out, and, we, and that's what we did. <laughs> he, was my, he, he became my best friend. We did everything together. Mel was different, though. When it came to religion. I went to my daddy one day. I said, Daddy, Mama, I said, uh, why does Mel have statues of Mary all over his house? And why are there crucifixes everywhere? And there's an altar in the front yard. And they have church every night. And on Saturday, he even goes to church. Why does he do all that? Oh, Daddy says. All of a sudden, he's a Catholic. I said, what is a Catholic? He says, uh, he explained it to me. I said, but Dad, I want him to be a Christian. He said, then teach him. I wasn't very good at it for the, for the next seven, eight years. I taught him. Seniors in high school, and we were in my room, and we just finished one of those little studies. I was doing more and more of them. Um, I was learning more myself, and finally, no, look, said, he just said it. He said, Rob, he said, I don't want to be a Catholic anymore. I said, well, what do you want to do? He says, I want to be a Christian. I said, man, this is great. I said, Mel, this is great news. He said, yes, I need your help. I said, what do you need me to do? He said, can you explain this to my dad? I said, well, sure. We're going to go convert his dad now. I said, mom, dad, I'll be right back. Got to go convert Mel's dad. So we, we got in the car. We drove over to the house, and uh, we, we, we walked in. And he said, now, dad, um, my friend Rob needs to talk to you about something. So he sat on one side of the table. It literally felt like he was at the doors, and I was over here. And I tried to convert Mel's dad like I tried to convert Mel. It didn't work very well. Mr. Hutzler, why does the Bible say you're supposed to go down into the water and you sprinkle? Mr. Hutzler, why does the Bible say um, not to call any man your father in a religious sense, but you call the priest father? Uh, Mr. Hutzler, why was Peter the first pope he was married? I, I didn't know how to do it, so I just asked questions. His, the more questions I asked, the, the, the redder the man's face got. And, the more quit, and he, he got so angry at me, he stood up, he, he grabbed his wallet, he pulled out all the cash, wadded up like a fastball, and he threw it as hard as he could at me. And he looked at me and said this, son, he said, you get out of this house right now. He says, you can have all my money, but you get out of this house. He, I never want you to see my son again. I never want you to see his brothers again. And he, I mean, his blood pressure. I know Mel's dad. He's a violent man. I was scared of him. Mel came over, and he put himself in between me and his dad. Grabbed me. He basically picked me up, and Mel's a pretty strong guy, and he took me outside. He says, Rob, I'm sorry. He said, I didn't know it was going to. I said, Mel, he said, Rob, you got to go. You got to go, Rob. And I left. I walked in the front door of my house. I sat in the lap of my mother. Kathy, and I just bawled. I said, Mom, what did I do? I've lost my best friend. It was 9 o'clock that night when the doorbell rang. My dad and I went to the door, unusual for it to ring at 9 o'clock at night. On the other side of the door was Mel Hutzler. He had two suitcases in his hand. He said, Mr. Whitaker, my dad says I can live at home and be Catholic. I can become a Christian and I can leave. He said, I choose the Lord, and I have no place to live. My mother grabbed him and hugged him and said, son, as long as we're here in the South, you have a home right here. That back bedroom is yours. And he moved in. Mel kept, uh, Mel kept, uh, kept coming to us at Northern Oaks where Daryl Conley preached, but he hadn't yet been baptized. And uh, but we kept telling Mel to make things right with his dad. I, there's a lot I could tell you. I'm, I'm going to cut this short here. One day, Mel came in and said, Rob, I met with my dad. I said, good, how'd it go? He said, well, dad said I can come home. I said, that's great. He said, one condition. I said, what is it? He said, I have to have a Bible study with a monsignor. I said, what in the world is a monsignor? He said, that's one level up from the Catholic priest. I said, man, that's exciting. Dad, mom, we're going to convert the whole Catholic church. I said, this is, they're sending one in from San Antonio. I said, man, let's get this. Man, we studied every day. We were getting it right, you know, getting ready for it. The day of the study, I got the stomach bug. <laughs> I said, Mel, reschedule. He says, Rob, there was another condition I didn't tell you about. 
you're not allowed to come. I said, what do you mean? He said, what I do, I must do alone. I said, no, you can't do this by yourself. He says, I'm not. I got this. He walked into that office of that Monsignor in Boulevardy, that cathedral. He walked right into his office. He said, Mr. Monsignor, he said, I just need you to answer some questions for me that I couldn't ask when Rob asked them. He said, would you tell me why the Ethiopian eunuch, in fact, in Acts chapter 8, he said, now you need to close that book. But Mr. Monsignor, in Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch went down into, he said, now I told you to close that book. But Mr. Monsignor, in Acts chapter 8, verse 34, the Bible says, he said, give me that book. And he took the Bible away from them. He said, son, he said, in the Catholic church, he said, we don't just go by the Bible. We go by the Bible and tradition, and it's my job to tell you what it is. Mel looked at that Mr. Monsignor. He said, Mr. Monsignor, he says, as far as I'm concerned, this Bible study is over. And he walked right out. For the day, and it was Sunday morning. The auditorium was full. Daryl Connolly called for the invitation. And the Northern Oaks Church of Christ just wept. As Mel walked forward. He's the most courageous man I've ever met. Because that day, he chose his heavenly father over his earthly father. And he was baptized. We went to the Southwest School of Bible Studies together. Today, Mel is the preacher at the Northern Oaks Church of Christ, where he was baptized. And every year, we do mission work together. Outside of my wife, he's my best friend. I believe that instance in my life really set me in a different course. I was going to be a pilot. My dad worked for the airlines. I love flying. I got my pilot's license when I was 18. I walked into my house one day and I said, Mama, I said, I don't want to be a pilot anymore. She said, what? I said, no. Nope. I believe I can take people higher with the gospel than I can in an airplane, and I want to be a gospel preacher. And that's why I'm here tonight. Jesus said in John 4 and 35, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are wide unto harvest. Brethren, there are people that need to be saved, and they're everywhere. You work with them. They sit in your pews. They're in your family. They're your co-workers. They're your neighbors. And they can be saved. We'll just do our job. I'm going to give you about a five-minute break, and, and uh, before I do that, uh, I want to mention, I, I said I'd mention something about the materials before we, before and after each lesson, so I, I do want to mention something to you, and I hope this is not the case, but maybe there is just something you can't get out of this week, and you can't make a session, so what we did is we, uh, we went to World Video Bible School, where Rudy Kane directs it. It is an amazing resource. They have studios that unsurpassed anywhere in this nation, and they filmed this entire seminar. I just re-filmed it, in fact, earlier this year, and they just updated it. It's got all five lessons on it, but there's something more. There's a second DVD inside. It is an actual Bible study. You can watch my wife and I do a Bible study. You can watch us use the booklets. We'll teach you how to use the charts that are in the white book, and you can see what a Bible study actually looks like. That's on the table. That's one of many things that can go in your tackle box this week. Thank you for being here. God bless you, brethren. We have a lot of work to do. Let's take five minutes. Let's come back about 8.15, and we'll do the second session tonight. Thank you.
All right, it's about time to begin our second session this evening. I do want to get you out at a reasonable hour. And um, so we're going to start our second session together. And as you're coming back into the auditorium, uh, do not worry. Those books will be there all week. They won't go anywhere. I won't let them. And um, so please, uh, uh, if you can, make yourself um, come back into the auditorium if you are able. Um, I have a very interesting story to tell you tonight about our arrival into Colleen, but I think I'm going to wait and tell it uh, sometime this week. Uh, it was a very unusual trip that we had here to Colleen, uh, uh, and um, I'm just glad we're here. 
but um, but we are glad to be here. I'm I'm always glad to be in Texas. Uh, first thing I want to do when I get to Texas is have water burger, and I want to go um, and find a taco cabana. And they have things called tortillas. We don't have those in Alabama. We have cardboard circles. And um, and then I, I want to find brisket. So I went over to Rudy's, and uh, and and it's just exciting. I, I I know you take this for granted, brethren. Count your blessings every day. And um, it is it is so good to to be able to eat that good food um, here. And I sure hope you're not broadcasting this. They'll they'll never let me back in Alabama after all this. But um, it's good again to be together with God's people. And um, so we're going to begin here in just a moment. Uh, I believe they're going to put the second um, lesson on the screen for me. And uh, we're going to focus in on the Bible. Um, we're, going to, we're going to spend a lot of time in the text in this lesson. So I set the stage. And now we're going to go into the text and we're going to look at what Jesus taught about evangelism. I hope I accomplished my mission. My mission was to make you a believer that evangelism can work today. And I know it works. I'm telling stories, but I really want to get into the Bible. And I want to share with you what God says. Before we go any further, um, you may not realize uh, how close you are to the place of the passing of one of the greatest evangelists. And he was a walking Bible study. Wherever he went, he did Bible studies. He, the church grew wherever he went. And he wrote materials. And we cannot let it die. We cannot let that happen. We do not want to spend the next 10, 20 years reinventing the wheel. Um, so what we want to do is make sure that the lessons he learned uh, are continuing to be taught. His name was Bobby Bates from Stevensville. He's an incredible, incredible teacher. And um, I want to share with you tonight a book he wrote. It's called Fishing for Men. His wife, Wilma, he called her Bones. She lives. And uh, every year when we come to Texas, <laughs> we get to uh, stay with Wilma. She insists on it. Now, we've been in the COVID era this year. Twice we've been to her house. She has three children. She says, Rob, please don't tell them you're coming. <laughs> she said, I said, Wilma, I don't think I should come. She said, oh, yes, you are. I said, Wilma, let me just see you from the outside of the door. She says, you're coming in. I said, Wilma, maybe just for a minute, you're eating supper. I said, Wilma, I grab a hold. You're staying right here, Rob. And um, we're very close friends. She's family. And uh, Miss, Miss Wilma, is, uh, um, she has become uh, such an asset to our work. There would not be a back to the Bible without Wilma Bates, because it would have died a long time ago. When I met Wilma and I started using Back to the Bible and uh, she was printing a thousand or so, uh, uh, she was printing a thousand or so a year, she's barely keeping it going. We printed over 50,000 last year. That means that people are doing Bible studies again. There's hope, brethren. Well, this book right here is called Fishing for Men. It's the mind of Bobby Bates. You want to know how he became one of the greatest evangelists of our time? You can read his mind. He's going to tell you about it. He's going to tell you what to do, how to do it. And uh, I read this occasionally. I've read it several times. Every time I read it, I learn something new. That's just one of the materials that's on the table. And we take that, uh, by the way, and someone said, you know, preacher, uh, couldn't you print that a little cheaper? I probably could, but I say I send that money to Wilma. And uh, when a preacher passes, sometimes the, the widow needs a little help. That's where the money goes. So every time you buy one of those books, that's, that's where I'm sending it, sending it to Sister Wilma. And, uh, but I don't want you to buy it uh, for any other purpose than to learn how to be a soul winner. And you'll learn something, I think, that maybe I can't even teach tonight. It's, it's vital. It's, it's essential that we stay with the message. I realized that uh, the religious world is on decline. One man came up to me, Brother Carter, after I did the first lesson. He says, Rob, there's no reason to uh, get too discouraged. By the way, I'm not discouraged. <laughs> I don't think it's in my DNA to get discouraged. Um, he said, but now, Rob, he says, um, you know, I know we're declining. He said, all the religions are declining in America. Brethren, that gives me no comfort. We're not all the religions. We are the church of Christ. There's no reason for us to be declined. We, we ought to be growing. 
We have the truth of Jesus Christ and the word of God. We have everything we need to be successful. I was standing behind the lectern Sunday morning, as a good preacher does. He reads over his notes. The double doors opened, and in came a couple. Never seen them before. Probably in their 50s. They walk down the aisle and uh, make a beeline for me. They're on a mission. Gets right down to the lectern. He said, are you the preacher here? And I said, yes, sir. Name's Rob Whitaker. He says, name's Richard Pratt. This is my wife, Daisy. He says, got a question for you, preacher. I said, lay it on me. He said, do you just preach the Bible here? I said, sir, that's all I preach. He says, good. He says, the church I left last week stopped doing it years ago. He says, I'm going to be listening to you, preacher. I said, listen carefully. During my lesson and sermon, you could almost see the smoke of the pen rise. I mean, they were taking down scripture so fast. They were writing them down. They had their Bibles open. I mean, you could just eye contact. They're engaged. I walked up to him after the service. I said, now, now it's my turn. I said, Richard, did I just preach the Bible? He said, man, that's all you preach. Haven't heard that much Bible in years. And I said, I said, tell you what, would you like to know more about this church? He said, I sure would. So let's go get a bite to eat. When we had him over and uh, started our Bible studies. We finished book number one. They knew the books of the Bible. They're writing all the answers. Man, they, they, they like it. Richard said, this is great. He said, Daisy, we finally found it. A church that follows the Bible. He said, sign me up. I said, sign you up? He said, where do I sign? I, sign? I said, no, no, Richard, it doesn't work like that. He said, Richard, he said, preacher, I'm sold. He said, it, it, you got it. He said, he said, just tell me what to do. And I said, well, you need to come back for another study. Another study? Preacher, did you not listen to me? He said, I'm ready to sign right now. I said, well, there's more than signing that needs to go on here. I said, can you come back and for a second study. He said, well, if you think I need it. And I said, well, we'll help you. So he came back the next week, him and his wife, Daisy, and they, we sat around the table again, and we went through the second study. And as we're going through the study, Richard begins to reach into his pocket. At the study comes to a close, he pulls out his checkbook, he gets his pen ready, he opens it up. He said, now, preacher, how much is this going to cost me? I said, cost you? I said, Richard, it, it doesn't cost anything. He says, shoo. He said, man, the last church we were in, if we missed, they'd send me a bill. I said, a bill? I said, no bills will be sent here, Richard. I said, I said, I said, tell you what, you come back for the next, the next study. He said, preacher, are you not listening to me? I am ready to join your church. I said, well, Richard, um, he said, I said, you need one more study. He said, am I that bad a sinner that I need a third study? I said, well, it's not about you being a bad sinner. There's just one thing you don't know. And if you'll come back, I'll, get, I'll do the third. Study. He said, well, okay, preacher. He went over, he's a logger and one of our elders owned one of the largest sawmills in the state of Tennessee. His name's Hugh Wayne Clark, Clark Lumber Company. And, uh, and one of the other elders is a sales clerk, and the loggers will come in and sell their logs. And, uh, and so he walked in, Richard walked into Joe Lynn's office. He said, Joe Lynn, I've got a bone to pick with you. That little preacher back there won't let me join your church. Huh? Richard, what are you talking? Richard, what did he tell you to do? Well, he said I had to come back for a Bible study. Brother Joe said, and that's exactly what you need to do. We finished the third Bible study. Richard looked up at me and he said, Rob, he says, you don't have a church, do you? I said, no, I don't. He said, and I can't join it either, can I? I said, no, you can't. He said, Rob, would you baptize Daisy and I so we can be added to the church? And I said, I'd be happy to. And we did. Today, Richard and Daisy are faithful members of the Willett Church of Christ where they were baptized. If there's a vacation Bible school, they're there. There's a gospel meeting, they're in the pews. If there's a mission trip, they're on it. We go overseas, they're there. It doesn't matter what it is. Daisy and Richard are there. Some of our best friends today. You know one of the best, the greatest blessings of life is? Teach someone the gospel. There'll be family like you can't even believe. I love Thanksgiving in our home. Can I tell you why? Because at Thanksgiving, my wife invites the converts that we've had through the years to our home to have a family Thanksgiving. We all sit around the table, sometimes two or three tables. I understand why Paul looked at Timothy and said, my son in the gospel. 
If you've never been a part of helping someone become a Christian, you're literally missing out on one of the most moving things this world has to offer. I believe that we're making a huge mistake today when it comes to personal evangelism. The mistake we're making is that we have left out the Bible when it comes to personal Bible studies. Brethren, we're great at talking to people about the church, inviting them to church, inviting them to gospel meetings, but we're not using the Bible. If we would use the Bible, it would, we would be amazed at how effective it would be in bringing souls to Christ. We're facing a generational crisis right now. We literally have parents who have children, and those children have never seen their father do a Bible study. We literally have daughters growing up who've never seen mom do a Bible study. Those children have grown up, and now they're having children. And we have two generations in the Lord's church, and we don't even know what a Bible study looks like anymore. And we wonder why we're dying. When I was at Willette in Red Bowling Springs, I was there 11 years. And uh, I, get, I started getting phone calls after five or six years. I was being asked to speak all over the place on evangelism. I, I don't know if you know about polishing the pulpit, but about 5,000 Christians assembled there. It's amazing. They put me in a little closet the first year, and the people were like, they were stuffed in there. The fire marshal got excited. <laughs> And then the next year, they put me in a ballroom and helped thousands of people. It was, it was solid people. People love to hear about evangelism. I said, man, we, the brethren need this. Well, I started getting phone calls. I, got, I get called. Elders would call me, and they said, Rob, can we come talk to you about evangelism? I said, come on. I love to talk about it. I got a call one day from an eldership. They said, Rob, can we come this date? I said, sounds good. I'll see you then. That morning, uh, the, the, the weather was terrible, thunderstorms, tornadoes across the middle of Tennessee, and, uh, and uh, they called me and said, Rob, we can't make it. I said, I understand. I said, can we do a phone conference? And so I said, I'll be glad to do one, and we, we set it up. And I, they started the first question. They said, preacher, they said, um, what are you guys doing out there in the middle of nowhere? 45 minutes to a Walmart, 30 minutes. He said, what are you guys doing out there to grow like that? I said, well, I'll tell you what it's called. I, there's nothing I'd rather talk about, man. It's called a personal Bible study. They're so exciting. Let me tell you all about what, uh, preacher, now stop. Hey, hold on. What did you call it? I said, it's called a personal Bible study. Let me tell you what we do. I said, my wife, uh, preacher, back up a little bit. Uh, where do you find those people at? Oh, I said, well, they're everywhere. You probably go to work with them. They probably sit in your pews. And I, I, I said, I said, I tell you what we do. My wife and I, we invite, now, pre preacher, uh, Yes. Um, how do you get to them? I said, oh. Um, uh, have you ever tried house to house, heart to heart? Yeah, we tried that once. We did one issue. And I said, well, what happened? Someone got upset, so we canceled. I said, okay. Um, um, he said, preacher, have you ever tried the big VBS? The big VBS. I don't even know what a big VBS is. I, I said, what is the big VBS? He said, well, you know, you rent the blow-up toys and the bouncy houses and the carnival rides. You bring them on into the parking lot and you get all the kids from the community to come. And, and No, I've never done the big VBS before. Uh, can I tell you what I do? I tell you, my wife and I find people that are not Christians. We invite them in. I tell you, it's got a personal Bible study. We use back to the Bible. We invite them into our house. We have them in there together. Hello? Hello? But then I don't know if it was the weather. I pray God it was. Because I love elders, and I want to presume the very best. Or they just hung up. I couldn't believe what just happened. I could not convince a group of elders that a personal Bible studies how church grows. I was so disgusted, I called my wife, and I said, Nicole, I said, i got to tell you what just happened. I said, let's write this down. She writing notes. I got off the phone with her, and I, I got on the Google. I said, I'm going to Google Church of Christ. I, I got to figure out what's going on. Can I share with you what I found? Here's what I found when I Googled Churches of Christ. Here's their website. Brethren, we have more programs and ministries than the U.S. government has. I mean, I want you to notice what we've got youth ministries. We've got teen ministries. We've got single ministries. We've got married ministries. 
Now, if you're married, you need a ministry. Wives, let me tell you, we can help you with your husbands. I know they're so honorary, but we've got ministries that can help your husband be a better husband. And, and we've got... We've got divorce ministries and parenting ministry. If you have children, you need a ministry. We will help you through the teen years. Very difficult. You know, aren't you glad we have youth ministries? I'm sure Peter had one. You would make it with that. You've got to have a good one. It's hard to be young today. I mean, that's how you grow churches. You've got to have youth ministries. And, and we have addiction ministries. We have depression ministries. We have the silver wings ministry. You know, when you get older, you, you have to have a ministry. And then don't, for, don't forget the golden oldies. Every Friday night we have Bible bingo. Do you know what I didn't find? Brethren, where is the personal evangelism ministry? Where is the ministry where this church says, we teach you and we train you how to do Bible studies? Friends, it, it is time that the church of Christ stop asking schools of preaching to train you all the training for Bible studies train our church members how to do Bible studies. I was sitting in my easy chair. And uh, my wife said, Rob, they're talking about you on Facebook. I said, oh, no, what now? I said, honey, what is it? And she said, she says, I know it's you, Rob. She says, you read something to me. She said, uh, there's this man out there. He's scaring the churches. I said, well, keep reading. She said, he's telling churches that we're dying. I said, well, we are dying. I said, uh, tell me more. Hey, 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 don't believe him. I said, what do you mean? She said, keep reading. She said, this man said, he said, we're not dying. We're growing. I said, in what world? He says, he says, look, lads to leaders. We had 5,000 people there, or 20,000 people, 10,000 at the youth retreat, polishing the pulpit, 5,000. He says, we're not dying, we're growing. Brother, you know what the problem with all that is? That's inward growth. That has nothing to do with outward growth. Yes, yes, we might be able to put together 20,000 Christians at a, at a lads to leaders event, but they're Christians. You talk to any Christian university, and there are not many left. You, 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 you talk to any brotherhood work. You, you go talk to Gospel Broadcasting Network. You, you go talk to World Video Bible School. You go talk to Southwest, Brown Trail, Memphis, Florida, Georgia School of Preaching, and you ask them if we're growing. You know what they're going to tell you? We're losing supporters every month because they're closing their doors. May I suggest... But instead of keeping the aquarium, we go back for fishing men. We're too busy doing all the inward stuff, and we're good at it. We're really good with inward cleaning. But we're terrible in our outward ministry. I'll illustrate it. I don't want to hurt you, but I want you to be honest with me tonight. I'm going to give you five years, over 1,500 days. I want to know how many Bible studies we've had in the last five years. In the last five years, how many Bible studies have we conducted? I know there's some of us sitting in the pew tonight and saying, now, preacher, listen, I, I, you, you don't know me very well because yesterday I went into the break room at work and I got my Bible out and, man, I read Mark 16, 16. I gave it to him, preacher. And my friend, he got his Bible out, and he read John 3, 16. And man, we had this brawl in the break room. And man, I, I defended the faith preacher. I wouldn't budge an inch. Great Bible study. And then there's uh, Sister, Sister Bell. Sister Bell says, oh, but preacher, I've I, I done some Bible studies too now. She said, I go to the tea room. I go to the tea. I have tea room talks every Monday afternoon. And I invite them to church. It's a great Bible study. Do it every Monday. And then there's Digital Don. Digital Don says, oh, hey, preacher, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, every night I get out my Facebook and I put those verses. Last night... He said, I, I put on there the Romans 16, 16. I said, churches of Christ salute you. Where's your church in the Bible? Boy, you should have seen the feed. Man, people are commenting left and right. It was a wonderful Bible study. How many conversions have you had doing that? Probably none. 
You know what the problem is with all of that? Brother, none of that is a Bible study. I'm not trying to discourage you from being religious on Facebook or reading your Bible at work or talking to your friends about the church. But brothers and sisters, people are not converted by little talks with Jesus. People are converted when we have Bible studies. And we're not doing it. Brother Dan, I think it's high past time that we put this book, that we put the Bible back into personal Bible studies. Open your workbooks, if you will. Go to page 108. I'm going to give you some things to write down. These are, these are three things you've got to write down, and, and these are principles, and I'm going to build on these every lesson. I, 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 I'm going to lay the group and give you three things tonight. So get your pencil ready, pen ready, and you make these notes. Number one, this is the first thing you got to do. you got to learn this lesson. you got to learn the lesson. Jesus taught, defer, don't debate. you got to stop debating and start deferring if you want a Bible study. You see, when I sat in the living room of Jackie and Sheila Birdwell, I kept telling myself, Rob, defer, Rob, defer, Rob, defer. I was just waiting. It's coming. She's going to ask me a question, and I'm going to defer it. I'm not going to chase a rabbit. I'm not going to, because she's going to fill it out there. And I'm going to be so tempted because I'm a preacher, and I've been taught. I've been taught. It's in my DNA. Rob, respond to every error, correct, every falsehood. Don't let them get away with it. Show them the scripture. But I keep saying, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. I got to defer it. I got to defer it. You chase that rabbit, you'll never catch it. Any hunters out there? Ever go rabbit hunting? You ever catch one by chasing it? <laughs> no, you stop and you let it come to you. You see, I'm not there to play 20 questions. I'm not there to play Bible trivia. I'm not there to show them uh, the answer to every question in life. I defer, not because I don't want to answer. I defer because they're probably not asking the right question or they're not ready for the answer. And it doesn't matter how good that Angus steak is. It doesn't matter if it's the prize one of Texas. It doesn't matter if you have the longest of the long horns and the best tasting steak in the entire state. An infant can't eat it because they're not ready. John 16, 12, Jesus says, I have yet many things to say to you now. He's talking to his disciples. He looks at his disciples and he says, listen, I've got a lot of stuff I need to tell you, but can can't understand it. You mean the master evangelist? You mean the greatest evangelist who ever lived? You mean the man who never preached too long? You mean the man who never preached too short? You mean the man who always said it right? You mean the greatest teacher the world has ever seen could not teach his disciples some things? That's exactly what that says. Question for me. Rob, if the greatest evangelist who ever lived couldn't teach his disciples some of those things, what makes you think you can? She looked at me and she said, Rob, she says, aren't you that church that doesn't believe in music? <laughs> Boy, I was ready for that. Man, the old Rob would have quoted her Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, and every other New Testament verse about music. I would have dissected the Greek word for solo. I would have, I would have showed her the difference between the Old New Testament. I would have showed her exactly what the Bible teaches on music, and I would have lost the Bible study. She's not ready for any of that. Sheila, now, I can't. So I deferred. I said, Sheila, I said, uh, you have music in your church? She said, sure do. I said, Sheila, I said, what kind of music do you have? Well, and so-and-so plays the organ. I said, how old is that organ? She said, well, 1956. I said, I said, have you ever played Amazing Grace? Oh, I love Amazing Grace. I said, what other songs do you play? For the next 20 minutes, I just asked her, and I deferred, and I deferred, and I deferred. You see, there's a temptation for me to try to impress somebody and to make sure they know I want to teach them that I know more Bible than they do. I'm smarter than you are, and I'm going to win this debate. And in fact, that's exactly what the Pharisees tried to do with Jesus. Have you ever read about the Bible studies of the Lord? I'm going to give you some of them. 
Luke 10, 25. Here's a Bible study. To open your Bible. The study, the Bible study to Jesus. This is having a Bible study. And then the Pharisees, they're, they're struggling. And so they said, call the lawyer. Call, call the lawyer. Why do you want the lawyer? Well, the lawyer's a ringer. Man, he put Jesus in his place. Now, friends, this is not a trial lawyer of, of today. This lawyer was a man schooled in the law, and they're tired of losing. And said, so, let's call him the ringer. Let's put Jesus in his place. He'll show Jesus up. And so they called him on in the Bible. And a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Do you know what Jesus did? He deferred it. He didn't answer. Jesus wasn't there to play 20 questions. Jesus wasn't there to play Bible trivia. Jesus wasn't there to show up the lawyer. And I promise you this, my brethren, tonight. If Jesus wanted to show the crowd that he was smarter than the lawyer, he could have turned him into a pretzel and won every debate. He's not there to debate. You know what my biggest problem was? I was more concerned about winning the argument than I was the soul. And when I did... And the more I won the argument, the more souls I lost. And I started to realize that I've got to be more interested in winning the soul than winning the argument. And you know, there are times, there are times when it's okay to lose. In fact, I would suggest to you that uh, until you understand that statement, you won't be successful. And so I began to defer. I began, to, I just started giving ground. I give more ground. I just kept, I just kept backing up. And I keep giving ground because I knew that unless I deferred, I was never going to get the Bible study. I don't want to debate it. I want to have a Bible study. And Jesus was content in this principle. It didn't matter how challenging the situation was. Our Lord always did the same thing. He deferred. Look at Matthew 21. This is pretty, uh, it's a pretty difficult situation he was in. Surrounded by Pharisees, Sadducees, various religious leaders. And he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came in as he was teaching. And, and they looked at Jesus and they said, Jesus, by what authority doest thou these things? Who gave you this authority? I don't know if there's a question that I'd be more tempted to answer than that one. For those of you who understand preachers tonight, brethren, that's my question. That's what I want to ask. Jesus hit it out of the park. Jesus, give it to him. Do you know what he does? I'll tell you what. I will ask. I will also ask you one thing. And um, if you tell me the answer, I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Huh? Jesus, stop playing games with them. Just, get, just tell them, Jesus. He says, no. By the way, the baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or men? He said, well, oh, oh, gee, gee. Oh, if we say, if it's heaven, he will say to us, why did you not believe him? But if we say of men, well, we, we fear the people, for they all hold John as a prophet. Jesus, we just can't tell you. He says, okay, neither I tell you by what authority I do these things. Jesus didn't play Bible trivia. In Mark chapter 10 and verse 17, there's another Bible study that happens. And here a man comes up to him, and he runs to him. And he gets down on his hands and knees, and he says, Jesus What must I do to inherit eternal life? Man, I don't know about you, brother, but if a, if a man came up to me and got on my hand, down on his hands and knees and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I consider that a good day. Well, tell him, Jesus. Come on, tell, tell him what he must do. He says, um, why did you call me good? Huh? Jesus, did you just not listen to this man? This man just asked you what he needs to do to inherit eternal life, Jesus. What in the world are you doing out there? He knew exactly what he was doing. Listen to him. 
Brethren, defer it. Don't answer. Learn to defer. Number two, write this down. You've got to learn to show people and stop telling them. We've got to stop telling people the answers, and we've got to show them the answers. I don't want you to win them over with your gift of gab. I don't want you to win them over because you have um, um, you know, superhuman memorization capacity, and you're able to quote all these scriptures. I don't want you to win them over because you know, you're know you just a smooth talker. I want you to show them the answer. I don't understand, preacher, what you're talking about. Let me demonstrate. Sheila said, now, Rob, I've been told, aren't you that church that believes you're the only one going to heaven? Boy, if that's not a loaded question, I don't know what is. But I was ready for it. I said, Sheila, I said, that's an important question you just asked. And I tell you what, um, I said, would you let me show you the answer so you can read it? She said, show me? She said, well, just tell me. I said, well, I, I can't really. It's not, it's not mine to tell. I, I can show you what the Bible says. She says, you mean like a Bible study? I said, we can call it whatever you want to, Shima. Jackie, is, is it okay for us to do a Bible study with this preacher? And Jackie looked over and he said, well, Sheila, I don't think it's ever wrong to study the Bible. And we did. Luke 10, 25, Jesus did the same thing. That's where I learned it. I was sitting there reading Luke 10, uh, and, and a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him and said, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And, and Jesus said, and Jesus said, what is written? Huh? Jesus, tell him. Jesus, you're sitting right there. There's no need for them to go back into the temple and look up the scripture. Jesus, you are the scripture. Just tell him, Jesus. But he wouldn't. He said, what's written? He said, what is written in the law? He said, you need to go to the law. You see, see, sir, what you need to do is read the law. And not only must you read it. I want you to put your eyes on it. I'm not going to quote it to you. I want you to listen to it. I want you to come face to face with the word of God. Brother, you want to break down the hardest of hearts? Let them read the Bible. You want to bring, you want to break down the most immoral of people? Let them read the Bible. Friends, it's hard to win an argument with God. But I can easily win it with you. We have got to take ourselves out of the equation. And we've got to put them in the text. Because the word of God has the power to save. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For the gospel of Christ is the power of God to save. Scarlett told me two things that night before that last Bible study. Here's the second thing. She said, Rob, after I became a Christian, she said, my best friend was in my room. They badgered me all the time. They always were complaining. Scarlet, I can't believe you did this. I mean, your mom and dad are members of that Baptist. Your grandmother's a member. Your aunt's a member. Scarlet, why did you do it? She said, my best friend. She looked at me. She said, Scarlet, I mean, I just can't believe you left us. I mean, Scarlet, be a Lutheran. I mean, be a Methodist, not a member of the Church of Christ. I mean, Scarlet, how could you? Scarlett said, I'd had it up to here. I looked at my friend square in the eyes. I said, do you really want to know? Because if you know what I know, you'll do what I did. I believe those are some of the strongest words I've ever heard come out of a new convert's mouth. You know what she's saying? She said, Rob, she said, I had no choice but to obey it's what God's word said. You know, somebody else that she knows said the same thing to me. It was her daddy. The night of the study. When he looked at me. He said, I have no choice. 
when you come face to face with the word of God and it will change your heart. You, it will take down all the religious error because this book has the power to save souls and we need it to dwell in our hearts. Stop telling them what the Bible says and let them read it. I love thy precepts because through thy precepts I gain understanding, therefore I hate every false way. We don't need carnival rides in the parking lot of the church to grow. What we need is for people to read their Bibles. And if I can't get an amen out of that, I might as well just quit. You know, one preacher said one time and back at San Pedro when I was sitting in the pews listening to him, saying amen to a preacher is like saying sick him to a dog. That was you. Let the words of Christ dwell in you richly. Put the word in their heart. Let them let it sink in. Cut them up a little bit. And the devil's had them long enough. Now it's the Lord's turn. This is the third thing you need to write down. We need to learn to plant and stop picking. We, we need to stop picking and start planting the Word of God. You say, preacher, explain this. Well, let me, let me try to do this. Uh, how many of you grew up in the Lord's church? You grew up in the church. You grew up, anybody grew up in the church? All right. So, several of us did. We went to Bible class, and uh, we probably learned this verse. It was Sister Bell Lee at the Northern Oaks Church of Christ, and I would walk in her little class. I was so excited to be there. And she said, now give me your memory. In our planting. And so I just said it. I'm going to write a book. You know, every preacher student needs to write a book. That's the first thing you need to do when you get out of school, right? That's the last thing you need to do. And I said, I tell you what, I'm going to write this book called Evangelistic Perception because I've got it nailed, you know. After all, I've learned everything there is to know. I could not have been more wrong. Brother, we don't need to be selecting. We need to be planting it to everybody. Well, Jackie and Sheila were missionary Baptists. They weren't just any missionary Baptist. They were the leaders of that missionary Baptist church. People would say, don't bother with Jackie and Sheila because they're never going to obey. Don't. Don't, don't, don't go over there and waste your time, preacher. Listen, it's, it's not going to work. Preacher, you got better, you know, there, there are better options out there than Jackie and Sheila. Can you advance the slide for me, please? It's not working. I got a phone call, and um, it was an eldership, and they said, Rob, uh, would you come teach us how to, would you come teach us how to do some evangelism? I said, I'd love to do that. I grabbed a group of about 15 of us, and we, we scheduled it, and we, we drove our vehicles over, and they were going to put us up and feed us. All we had to do was teach them and work. And so I, I, we, we, we arrived at the church building, and there was the deacon of evangelism. Of course, you got to have a deacon of evangelism. And the deacon had the map out. I love maps. Love maps. He had the map out. He had it quadrant off. One, two, three, four. And, and on quadrant four, there was an X. He's explaining the quadrants. He said, now listen. He said, now, I'm going to put you guys over in quadrant one. I said, wait, I have a question. 
I said, why is there an X on quadrant four? He said, oh, um, Rob, not good candidates for the gospel. They're Rob. You know, a little bit undesirable. Rob, I, I think, well, I tell you what, the elders and I talked about it, and we think the kind of people we want, we're going to put you in quadrant number one. I, I said, uh, brother, I said, I think I'll take quadrant four. He said, Rob, you're not listening. He said, now, very undesirable in that area. He said, they always want money. I said, now, I tell you what, brother, you put me in quadrant four because I think that's exactly where Jesus would go if he was standing here. Brother, we are planters. Our job is to plant the seed to every single person. We have a prejudice problem in the church. And I'm not talking about skin color. What I'm talking about is a spiritual prejudice. Where we selectively choose who we're going to teach. And you know, Rob, and let, me, let me share with this how this works. Rob, don't go over there. There's two women living in the same house, and I think they're... And Rob, don't go over there because, you know, because that man over there... See the bottles in his yard? He's a drinker. And Rob, stay over, stay away. Rob, they've been divorced. She's been divorced for, you know what the odds are that she's got a scriptural marriage. Stay away from her, Rob. That is a terrible, don't go. And Rob, I tell you what, this over here, man, I don't think they could put a dollar in the contribution plate. And, and, and Rob, I, I mean, right over there, boy, you should hear the moral problems they've got. It would take us years to, now Rob, They've been going to that church. That's, they're leaders in that church. They're not going to leave that church. Brethren, by the time you're done eliminating everybody, there's no one left to teach. It's called spiritual prejudice. And we just start eliminating people left and right. It is one of the most dangerous prejudices we have in this world. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him and said, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But I want you to know what this, 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 this lawyer did. He, he, he tempted him. That lawyer wasn't interested in the truth, and Jesus knew it. When that lawyer walked up to Jesus, Jesus could see his heart. His heart was as crooked and sinful and as hard as a man's heart could be. And the, man, the Bible says all he wanted to do was to justify himself. Dear friends, may I say tonight that Jesus had every reason and good cause to turn around and leave right there. But he didn't, did he? Because every soul in this world deserves to hear the gospel. Even a lawyer. And Jesus looked at that lawyer and he said, um, Sir, who's my neighbor? Do you know what he did? Jesus preached to that lawyer the greatest parable that's ever been told on earth, the parable of the Good Samaritan, to save his soul. May I suggest to you that Jesus was not in the picking business? For his Jesus was in the planting business, my, my, my family, we, we were out at Willette, and uh, Willette's a, it's out in the middle of nowhere, folks. I, it's hard for me to explain this. Um, and um, we're on what we call Willette Mountain, foothills to the Smokies, and there's not a lot of people. It's just farmers, uh, cornfields, uh, um, cows. And, um, but the farmers need to eat, so they opened this little, this little brick, the mortar store across the street. It's probably built in 1900. They cleaned it up and opened it up to serve food, breakfast and lunch. Well, I don't know how much you know about farming, but farmers, they don't eat, they don't eat breakfast the same time preachers do, Brother Dan. See, farmers eat breakfast about 5 o'clock in the morning. I'm not even up at 5 o'clock in the morning. But that's a, so I never got to eat breakfast there. They're always sold out. But now when it comes to lunch, I'm awake. And about 11 o'clock, they start serving, and you better get there. So my kids run, Daddy, Daddy, it's 11. You better get, let's get there. We know if we're not there by 1130, it's gone. 
So we get over there, we walk across the street in this old store, and and, uh, and everybody knows everybody. And uh, hey, everybody, hey, well, here he comes, that Campbellite. Huh? Yeah, here he comes. Come on in here, Campbellite. Come on. You want a log? Come on in here. Now, the old Rob would have walked up to that man and told him exactly what a Campbellite was. And I'd have quoted more scripture than the man never heard in his life. But that would have done nothing to save his soul. I'm not there to win an argument. I walked over to him. I said, sir, do you see that sweet lady over there, that pretty lady, that's my wife, best cook in Macon County. That little girl right there, best dessert maker you ever meet. I tell you what, tonight, my wife wants you to come to our house. I want you, she's going to cook you the best meal you've ever eaten in your life. Really? I said, yes, sir. And that little girl right there going to cook you the best dessert you've ever tasted. Really? I said, yes. And afterwards, we're going to have a Bible study. Huh? Now, pre simmer down now, preacher. Now, preacher, there's no need for you to talk like that. Now, I didn't ask for no Bible study. Do you know what just happened? I planted and he picked. It's biblical. In Acts 13 and 46, Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God first should be spoken to you. But see, you put it off from yourselves, not me. You put it off from yourselves. And you, not me, you judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Brother, I'm not in the picking business. I'm in the planting business. And if a man is going to not obey God, it's not going to be because I didn't try to teach him. It's not going to be because I judged his heart. It's not going to be because I said he's not worthy. It's going to be because he he said it. And shame on us if we have practiced picking instead of planting. Some of, some of the most faithful conversions we've had have been from people that others would have said would have never obeyed the gospel. I believe the scripture has the power to divide the honest heart from the I got a I got a phone call once uh, after Sheila became a Christian and she was frantic she said Rob I said yes Sheila she said Rob I just can't do this anymore asking me Rob why I left Rob yesterday a man came into the bank where I was working he got down on his hands and knees and he started to pray, Jesus, that, that an evil spirit would come out of my heart and I would come and be a Baptist again. I said, really? She said, Rob, it was so embarrassing. I can't do it anymore, Rob. I quit. I said, now, Sheila, uh, I can't imagine what you're going through. I can't even imagine how you feel. Sheila, would you try one thing before you quit? I knew you'd say that, Bob. And I said, well, just one thing. I said, the next time someone comes to you and, I don't know, makes you feel bad because you left or claims to call some spirit out of you, um, invite him to your house for dinner. Dinner? Oh, did you hear what I just I said, yes, Sheila, but you'd love to make dinner. Invite them to your house for dinner. Now, why would I do that? And I said, because after dinner, you're going to invite them to have a Bible study. Now, Bob, I can't do a Bible. I said, yes, you can, Sheila. Back to the Bibles right out there in the entryway. Grab yourself your set, and I want you to have a Bible study. You and Jackie can do it. Rob, are you sure I should be doing this? I said, I'm 100% certain. Sheila, never ask us again about that. I was so curious. Nicole and I, she said, Rob, what ever happened to Sheila? I said, honey, I don't know. I said, but let's find out. I called her. I said, Sheila? Remember that phone call you had months ago? Oh, yes, Rob. Now, I was just upset. And I said, I know. I said, well, tell me what happened. She said, well, I took your advice. Somebody did that to me again. And she said, I told them to come over to my house for supper, and we'd have a Bible study. She said, Rob, I haven't seen him since. She planted. And they picked. Did you write those three things down in your book? Number one, defer, don't debate. Number two, show, don't tell. Number three, plant, don't pick. After I left my second work, we were baptizing and we were growing. We started about 110, 120, 130, 140. I mean, we were just growing. And um, I had an opportunity to go to Willette, and uh, it was hard. 
but we left Hillsboro, and um, and I didn't know what was going on. I, I, it's hard to keep up with. I, I, I try to stay out of a church after I've preached. I don't want to be a hardship to the preacher, so I don't ask a lot of questions. But a member came up to me after a couple of years. He said, Rob, I really need to talk to you. I said, sure. And he said, Rob, uh, he said, that new preacher we hired at Hillsboro? I said, yeah, tell me what's going on. He said, Rob, he tells everyone that evangelism doesn't work today. I said, really? He said, yes. He says, yeah, yeah, we're, um, we're Generation X, you know, Z, was it P? What, what are we in now? Whatever it is. He said, they don't do Bible studies. I said, news to me. I said, what, what, what does he tell you that work? He said, you go to the internet, search, internet shops after all. And, and you know, you, you just had good conversation about Jesus. You know, just have a good talk about the Lord and invite them to church. And, and, and I said, when they come, what does he do next? He said, oh, he said he preaches and they come forward and they're baptized. I said, okay. I shall be, I said, brother, I, I said, I just have one question for you. How is it working for you? He said, that's the problem. Rob, we haven't had a baptism since you left. Have we forgotten, brothers and sisters, that the Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul? If we want people to come to Jesus, what they need is a Bible study, not a little talk about Jesus. We need to get them to the book. I'll end with this. He told me his story years ago. I said, would you let me, would you write it down and would you let me tell it? Because there's a lesson that the church needs to hear. He says, you may use it if you think it will help. I had little interest in the church during my teenage years. It wasn't until I joined the Navy at the age of 19 that I realized there was something missing in my life. And I began my search for the church of the Bible. After visiting different denominations, I finally visited the Church of Christ, where I was based at a naval air station at Paxtewant River, Maryland. I had no idea at the time that my brother Terry, he was actually pursuing the ministry in the Church of Christ. When morning, I decided to take a taxi to the nearby Church of Christ in Lexington Park, Maryland. I was immediately surrounded as they showered me with attention. They insisted on taking me out to eat and returning me to the base. They provided me transportation from services from that day forward. I did not know anything about communion, so I took communion along with everybody else. It was not soon after attending that a young fellow sailor came up to me, and he learned that I was not a member of the Church of Christ. He discouraged me from taking communion. I was okay. I just continued to, I, I continued to, um, I continued going. The members, you know, they were very hospitable. They even provided me transportation, took me out to eat. It was not long before the minister, Frank Starling, had me into his home for a Bible study. He said, I think it was the Jewel Miller film strip studies. He took me through all the studies, and it was very evident that I was at the church of the Bible. He says, soon thereafter, I'm... 1965, after completing the final study, I was baptized into Christ for the remission of my sins. Brother Dan Carter, do you know why that story me? Because that man is Gary Whitaker. And he's my dad. And if it wasn't for that one Bible study that Frank Starling did, I wouldn't be here tonight. And because of that one Bible study, my father traveled over to a little town in Ohio called Vermilion. He walked into the Church of Christ, and there the preacher's daughter sat. Her name was Kathy. She's 17 years old. 
And because of that one Bible study, my father met Kathy Whitaker, his wife. And because of that one Bible study, they had two children, Rob and Chrissy. Rob grows up and he becomes a Christian because of that one Bible study that Frank Starling did. And because of that one Bible study, Chrissy, Christina, she grows up and she becomes a Christian. And because of that one Bible study, I meet Nicole of Nashville. And because of that one Bible study, Nicole and I have two children, Hannah and Jared. And because of that one Bible study, Hannah grows up and she becomes a Christian. She works with her family tonight. And because of that one Bible study, my son grows up and he becomes a Christian. He works with his family tonight. And because of that one Bible study of Frank Starling, my sister meets Joey, Joey Barkley and they get married. And they have two children, Michaela and Maddie, and they grow up. And because of that one study, they become Christians. Tonight, I'm not asking you to change the world. God is not asking you to grow the church by yourself. Tonight, there's no expectation that by yourself, this is all going to turn around. But I can tell you this tonight. Brother, would you just do one Bible study? Please. Sister, would you just do one? Thank you for being here. I hope you'll come back tomorrow night. We're going to continue our lessons together. I, I pray that it will be worthy of your time. I know that uh, there are many things to be doing. And, but tomorrow, we're going to learn how to get into a Bible study from Jesus. He was, he's a master at it. And I, I do want to mention one thing before you go tonight. And I know some of you are watching, uh, I guess, on a Facebook feed or a, maybe a YouTube feed, a website. And uh, I have materials available. And if you can't be here to get them, um, maybe you can just um, let an elder know or a member know. And they can pick them up for you. Or maybe during the day when you come and get your workbook. I think the elders are providing this if you want to come get it. And uh, the back of the Bible, if you're watching on, our, um, uh, uh, on, the, on the Internet stream, you can come get that. There are materials on the table. And um, just let us know. We'll make sure you get them. But these are for sale on the table. I wish I could give them to you. I, I really do. But I can't buy the literature for the church. <laughs> um, so um, this, is, uh, this is called the Old Testament Simplified. And I have the New Testament Simplified. And uh, um, I did this. Uh, why did I do this? Because I want people to learn the Bible. And... Um, to me, the Bible was always hard to learn because it was so big. So I wanted to simplify it. So what I did is I made, uh, I broke it down to simple rhymes. I started rhyming the Bible. And I rhymed chapters, and I, I do that to teach people the Bible. And I'm going to give you an example, and then you're dismissed. Um, Acts chapter 1, the work of Jesus on earth is done. One, done. In chapter 2, the church is in view. To view. In chapter 3, Peter and John heed the lame man's plea, three, plea. In chapter 4, open comes the jailhouse door, four, door. In chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, they tell lies. But in chapter 6, there are seven servants picked. In chapter 7, Stephen looks into heaven. In chapter 8, there's the Simon's fate. There's Simon the Great and the eunuch's fate. In chapter 9, did you know Saul was struck blind? And in chapter 10, they let the Gentiles come in. I do that through the Bible. I either alliterate it or I rhyme it, and those are on the table. If you think they could help you in understanding the Bible, I would, I would uh, provide those for your consideration. Thank you for being here tonight. Let's pray, and we'll be dismissed. Our Father, we're grateful for eternal life. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to study thy word. We thank thee for thy humble servant, for the Carter, and for the elders that are here shepherding this flock. Bless this church and those who are attending. We pray that... The spirit of evangelism will be revived in the church in America. Help us to rise, Father, even though times are low. May we 
infuse this nation again with the righteousness of Jesus Christ that our land might be healed. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.